Call session to order. <clears throat> First thing on agenda is request approval for, on allocation of opioid funding. Ed Singer and Doug Brown. So we're bringing the folks with us uh, for each of the proposals that we have that are from the organizations that are going to implement what we're suggesting. And uh, I guess as background commissioners, you, well, first of all, uh, Jim Rodriguez and Amy Gramada from the school system. Amy's a uh, vice principal at North Carroll. And Jim, what's your, your title? So, uh, supervised Physical Education and Health. So, um, has some great people working for you. Yes, you, that's right. That's <laughs> wow. A couple of them. <laughs> <sighs> so, Doug and I were here about a month or so ago to talk that's about the, uh, the money the commissioners had set aside for opioid initiatives, and we had some suggestions that you had approved at that point in time. We have four additional <laughs> proposals today that, uh, that are in front of you. So, um, we're going to go over the four proposals. You all, you all can choose whether you want to vote on them individually or vote on them as a, as a group once you're done, after we've had a chance to present them and you, you've had a chance to consider and discuss them. But the, uh, the background is, is of course, the commissioners had set aside $300,000 annually. Um, as we explained to you before, um, we didn't think there was a way that we could uh, implement new programs this year. So we were looking at uh, this year's money as one-time funding, and we're going to come back to you uh, during the budget season next year and talk about what we think we want to implement for, for this ongoing funding with, for, for opioids. But we have four proposals before you today uh, talking about how we would use some of that remaining $115,000 that's left from what we, get, what we had approved the last time we came before you. And the first piece that we want to talk about is uh, Sources of Strength program, which is uh, a program that's in the middle schools. Uh, before you go there. Let, let me just ask if you could address one issue as you answer the questions. Because <clears throat> I'm, I'm reading ahead of you and I'm seeing that we're talking about behaviors that are warning signs. But on one hand, we're having one, there's one storyline which is going in the direction of opioid addiction as a result of uh, addiction to misprescribed or overly prescribed prescription drugs. Right. That's one storyline as to how the addiction occurs. And now we've got another, and then there's another storyline which talks about things such as depression, trauma, and other warning signs of at-risk youth. So which one are we addressing as we talk about each of these four proposals? Okay, now go ahead. And, and, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of that. And Commissioner, if I, if I don't adequately address it as we're going through our proposals, you can, uh, you can let me know and we'll, we'll try to make sure that we, uh, we cover, your, um, cover your concerns. But the, uh, again, the, the senior policy group when we met uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what do we do about these middle school age kids who, who have um, a lot of problems in the homes that we didn't necessarily be, see before, where we have uh, often two parents who might be substance use uh, addicts that, and the, the children are still in the home and, and, and they're living with us on a day-to-day -day basis, or, or there's domestic violence or other type of problems in the home. What do we do about these kids and how do we prevent them from going down that, that same road? And, and I think you know, the intent was is we try to do something out of the box with this because, as I mentioned before, um, the state and the federal government are putting a lot of money towards treatment and towards interventions and things of that nature to people who are already addicted. And I think a lot of the discussions we've had is what do we do to keep people from becoming uh, addicted to these opioids to start with? And I think, as, as Commissioner Rothschild mentioned, a lot of folks might, might start with, 80 percent start with prescription drugs. What we're, we're talking about doing is wanting to intervene with folks who might not have that positive mentorship in their own home, establish uh, relationships with adults that they can turn to to help them make the, the right decisions. You know, again, we're, we're not going to be able to set a, uh, a child's in, entire moral fiber. I mean, a lot of that comes from the home. But lacking uh, that interaction with, 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 a, with an adult who, who, who's caring and, and provides that mentorship that most of us have in our homes or, or had in our homes, this gives them an opportunity to engage with an adult that can be a positive role model for them. And the numbers are up here on, on the screen that talks about uh, 162 students were identified as homeless in 2017 to 2018. Uh, 46 parents or guardians died from drug overdoses. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. Uh, suspensions are, have increased in, in our middle schools and high schools. And uh, self-injury and suicide uh, interventions are on the rise. Um, Carroll County has the highest rate 
of non-fatal suicides among kids in the ages of 5 to 17. We need the highest rate, highest rate per number of students. Per, per, num per, per people that are right. that age, we okay. have the highest, we have the, it's, it's a rate per 100,000, okay. but if you look statewide, and, and this even includes Baltimore City and, and the, other, the other jurisdictions we always look at as having, having more significant issues than we have, from a rate of suicide, Carroll County has the highest rate of, of um, suicide attempts that are not completed that amongst that age. Now, there, there may be a number of reasons for that. Maybe we're better at identifying it than some other jurisdictions are, but, but that's uh, statistically what we're showing. Back up one slide, Ed. Sure. Because I'm not sure. I, I think I know you. But I'm, I, where you and I'm go going the wrong way. Point. There we go. So just I want to understand the relevance of this, because I thought we're talking about primarily, are we talking about opioid issues? So well, two questions. Of, of the 162 students that are homeless, would, do, 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 do we have a higher rate of opioid abuse among the homeless? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. We're, we're, we're seeing that as more of a problem in the homeless population than, than we do anywhere else. And I think what we're, uh, Commissioner uh, Rothschild, I, I don't think that you can isolate opioids as, as, as a single problem and try to deal with that. You, you need to take a look at the whole behavioral health piece. Um, you know, mental health and, 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 and substance use uh, are, 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 are joined hand in hand. And a lot of these other factors, whether, whether it's homelessness or, or violence in the home or, or other behaviors, can, can lead to people, statistically it's, it's shown that there's a much higher rate of people who become addicted to substances, whether it's opioids, whether it's alcohol, whether it's, whether it's something else, okay, you've answered, who you've are answered, experiencing you've answered these types the of... Short answers are fine. Okay. Going to the last bullet on that slide, uh, it says that we have the highest rate of non-fatal suicides. Where are we with respect to fatal suicides among 5 to 17-year-olds? Are we lower we're, or we're, higher? We're, we're, we're in the top. We're, we're, we're towards the top. We're not number one. I, I, if I remember, we're like third. Um, I, I don't have that chart in front of me, but if we're, we're, we're somewhere... I think we're third out of all the jurisdictions as far as I, we, we had uh, there were five uh, suicides in that age range in, in Carroll County last year. Third most or third, third best? Third most per, per population. Right. Maggie was just saying that's fifth. <coughs> Number five. We're, we're fifth. Fifth in the state. But it's it was we had we, so that's per 100,000 population we're looking at. So we're, we're fifth in the in the state as far as and being the worst the most suicides um, in the state of Maryland. And the, here in Carroll County. And of those suicides, you said they were, they were fifth highest. Do we have numbers on what percentage of those suicides were Carroll County full-time Carroll County residents versus people that came into the county? And these were, these are all Carroll County residents. There, there's, it, it's not that we. It's based on their uh, res, residents, their, their address of their residents, at the time that this happened. There so any theories on why Carroll County is ranking fifth highest. I mean, there, there could be any, any number of reasons for that, but I, I, you know, they'd all be hypothetical at this point if I were to tell you. What's the major reason behind the uh, suicide attempt? I, I mean, I, mean, I, I asked the school pressure. people, you guys may have a better. I would say, um, and again, this is just from memory from last year, yeah. there's not, nothing not precise, but, um, a lot of home issues um, and homes, home and peer. It's usually you know, peer to peer stuff, you know, the pressures um, of kind of growing up in 2018. Um, I think that that has a big piece of it um, with social media and who's saying what about who and all of those pieces. And then a lot of just the home situations. You know, kids are, if you ask me just as a principal doing this, I think kids are losing hope. Um, and that's one of the most important things that we can help them have, you know? And so, I think that's what it is. They're just kind of losing hope by the circumstances. Of the life no of the hope and don't know where to go. Yep, that's absolutely. So absolutely. why would that be a, a higher here than other places? I don't. Well, don't know that we, I don't we need to know? I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, it seems like kind of um, <clears throat> rather alarming that. I, I, and I, I don't know that there is is a good answer to that. I mean, I, I I've, I've talked to some folks about what. You know, maybe uh, my, my thought was is, uh, you know, if we, we've got these suicide uh, attempts happening, maybe it's because we're putting more pressure on our kids than we might see in other jurisdictions. But I'm not sure that that's what it is. And I, I do think a lot of it has to do, well, part of the Sources of Strength program is, is, is giving people somebody to, 
turn to that they can talk to in developing uh, relationships between adults and, and, and kids so that if, you know, if they're having struggles at home, that they're comfortable in approaching somebody and talking about it and, and, and trying to prevent them from getting to this, this point. Now, exactly what's causing it, I, I don't know that, that'd take a study that, sure. that I don't know that any of us would, well, I don't even know how you'd put it together. So is the number going up or down? Well, so, so our number's been going up. Generally, it's been tre trending upward. Okay. So. <laughs> but this sort of strength program is something. We just, we've just implemented this. Last year was the, the first year uh, <coughs> of the program. It was a combination of uh, some health department funds that we were able to mm -hmm. la uh, leverage from Behavioral Health Administration some hospital foundation funds and some resources from the school system to try to get this off the ground. And, and the, the school system's been a great partner in trying to, trying to move this forward. But I, I think overall it's, well, I think one of these slides will show you it's, it's, it's not just about suicide prevention, it's about that overall interaction with, with uh, positive mentoring, uh, having peers as their supports, and, and trying to uh, deal with these risky behaviors. Yeah, it's really the whole mental health picture, isn't it really? For, for uh, at risk kids in that age group. Were all five of them, uh, all five of the suicides, school, uh, Carroll County Public School students, or not necessarily? I don't have those statistics, Commissioner. Okay. I, can, I can probably find out, but uh, I, I don't have those statistics. Well, I just, I, I think in terms of just trying to understand what programs we have and where, and where maybe there's some resource. I mean, obviously, you know, coming to the conclusion as to what causes things like this and how to deal with it and all that is almost impossible to do so you start to look for clues to say well you know is there a segment of the population where we're having more or less is, is there something that's working better or not I, mean, I think you just almost have to kind of look f for, for clues and not to say you're not but I, I just say that you know from our perspective um, you know so much ambiguity and then there's so much ambiguity in what to do about it it's hard to know where to put the right resource Right, and I, and I don't think, you know, I think the school system is doing as much as they can, and there's a lot that's yeah, no, no, the school system. not about that. I'm, just, I'm trying to look but, for, you know, what are the, what is the, you know, are there any correlate? And maybe they, and maybe there aren't. Maybe they're just completely random, but it's not random if we're higher than other jurisdictions. That's that, that you know, unless it's just one year we are, one year we're not. No, know? it's it's been, it's been relatively consistent that we've we've been towards the top if we haven't been at the top uh, over over the past four or five years. Um, and, and, and I will say, you know, this is, again, this is, we're, we're talking about the focus on this is supposed to be on opioids, but I think you do have to look at the overall behavioral health picture, as you, I think you mentioned, or one of the commissioners mentioned that, you know, it, it's not just the one issue. It's, it's all wrapped around this. Well, I think the one thing we keep learning is that none of these things occur in isolation, whether we talk about school security or we talk about... Uh, you know, lots of different issues. It's like they're all interwoven into this bigger picture, which is, you know, uh, that status of mental health, particularly among those at risk. So, and I apologize for being late. That's that's okay. I'm. Uh, so, there there are a number of programs that are being implemented to address these issues that we're talking about. Uh, the Handle with Care program that you're probably familiar with, the state's attorney's office. Uh, in conjunction with the sheriff is implemented with the school system. Trauma-informed care that we're working on um, from a system of care standpoint. There, the school system has a, a bus driver training program on trauma-informed response, and there's all these partnerships amongst all the organizations we work with on these things. And sources of strength is just a piece of this. So I kind of like this graphic because, and, and there's, a, uh, there's a brochure up there that I think kind of sums it up. And, and this wheel kind of shows all those things, I guess, that we think fit into um, dealing with, with this issue from, from, a, from a mental health, whether it's preventing substance, substance use problems, preventing, uh, preventing suicide or suicide attempts. I, I think that this, this wheel kind of sums up a lot of what's, what's involved in that. And that's what this program's about. It's an evidence-based practice. Um, it harnesses the power of pure social networks to change unhealthy norms and culture. So you can see what the uh, what the goals of uh, what sources of strength is here. 
It's about upstream prevention. I think this graphic, it's, 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 it's an interesting piece for, from the Sources of Strength program, but it talks about trying to intervene before we get to the point where, where the children have a problem, the, 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 the adolescents have a problem that we're, where we're treating them for, for something. This is, this is trying to keep them from getting to the point where they have a clinical di diagnosis that we, we have to deal with or, or helping them with, with issues that might get them to the point where they have something that we, we, where we have to do an intervention. This is, this is the ups, upstream prevention piece that we're talking about. <clears throat> so this is just kind of how this is laid out. It's uh, connected adults, advisors, teachers, staff, community members with uh, diverse peer leaders from all social groups. So you want to have, you don't want to just have the best of the best kids involved in sources of strength and you don't, don't want to just have the kids who have the most need involved in sources of strength. It's mixing those kids together to form positive norms so that the, so so that the, all the kids can benefit from this it gives you know it gives those kids who 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 are um, leaders an opportunity to have a positive impact on their peers and those who need a little bit of help somebody that they can ask for that help so the initial program last year was rolled out at West Middle School and this year the school systems rolled it out to East Middle North Carroll Middle and Winters Mill High Schools and they're hoping to expand to four more schools next year. So these are just a couple of quotes from, one's from Amy, who's, who's sitting here with us today, and uh, talking about the positives of uh, the Sources of Strength program. So how do we measure that, Amy? How, how do we, I mean, I, I know there's sort of certainly anecdotal measures, right, but but what are the other indicators? And that, that's the, that is the hard part. I mean, that's. 100% the hard part. Right. So you start off with that um, through this all started in North Dakota, and so they have some um, 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 it's not questionnaires, surveys so that, that they give the students to right. kind of see where they are when we start and where they are in the end. And so it, they have found over the years that the most impact in the first year is really with the adult, the adult leaders and uh, the adult mentors and the peer leaders. So the, the the 20 to 60 kids are involved in the school. They have that most impact. And then by year three is when they started to see the impact greater, you know, into the whole school community. So the, the way that they found that and the way that we, data that we use is we start with just the peer leaders in the first year and they kind of do like a little pre-assessment that they have. And then they answer almost those same questions in the spring to see kind of what their growth was. And that's kind of the basic level of understanding what the sources of strength are and you know, and how they can be used and then how we can connect others to that. And then in the second year of implementation, implementation, we'll start with throughout the whole school and asking them, having the students take that same survey, um, you know, kind of what do they know, and then just keep collecting that data. But that's really it. That's all that comes from sources of strength. So have we done that first survey with the full school at West Middle yet as we're in the I'm second year? I'm not there year? anymore, so I'm not sure. I was, I was there last year, and now I'm in North Carroll, so I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. And, I, and I'm not 100% sure to be able to definitively answer that question. So I know that uh, we're in the process of trying to collect data so that, you know, because it's an evidence-based program, obviously what evidence are we talking about? So, um, you know, I know that um, with a new principal change, um, it's a matter of someone like myself from central office trying to connect with those individuals, school administrators, and the folks that are, that are point people uh, at that respective school to, to say, hey, you know, not only are we going to make an impact, and, and anecdotally, as you say, here's some, some really neat things about how it's making an impact on the culture of the kids, but we need some evidence uh, along with that. So, so is this discretionary at the level of the principal? Or is it in, is terms, of, a, in, uh, in, in, tr in terms of doing it? Doing it actually, and, so as uh, we, I'm part of school health council with a few yeah. other folks, right? And uh, once this came to our attention, uh, we realized it was... A, we believe it was a very positive program to bring into the school system. Right. And, and, and knowing uh, Ms. Gramada here would be a principal that would embrace this and want to be able to help kids, we went to her first at West Middle right. in order to pilot the program. But I mean, so, in terms of its continuation, sure, sure. is that optional or is that something that well, will happen? It, at the moment, because it's in the beginning stages, we are now approaching principals that ha really have a need in their particular area. You know, so those pr schools that were mentioned, those schools have, it's been highlighted to us that the need is great there. So we approached the administrative staff about that. They've embraced having it. Mm -hmm. And then as we move forward, it then it would be something in which we are gonna strategically 
uh, go to those respective schools and the superintendent's fully behind this to make it lack of a better word mandatory or lack make, make it hey this is something we're going to do but i we're like do the word mandatory don't 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 feel like you have to skirt yeah. around that i like no, that word but i'm just saying we're, we're gonna, we, we need to do it strategically yeah. is my yeah. i guess yeah. is my point right it's not it's right. not going to just take a, a big bite of that apple right we're going to go ahead and right. make sure we're doing it but correctly. in terms of the program itself i mean i know there's always a need to look at you know how it how it's performing within your area your jurisdiction that, yeah. but but there is evidence out there Yes. other places yes. that the program has been effective, that, right? That is correct. So this is not sort of a, no. hey, it seemed like an interesting idea. Let's, let's I mean, that so, is absolutely correct. so what is the, other than just time and probably money, what, what, what are the, <laughs> if this was like just the best and you go through the first year and say, you know what, yeah, this is working, what is the constraint in taking it and saying, okay, we don't have 10 years to implement something like this. So is it is it money? Is it time? Is it is it uh, um, you know level of participation? Is it what what, what, are the, what is the constraint that says okay if we find something that works we're, we're going to do something? Else. So Commissioner Howard, you're hitting upon all those all those factors, right? Your time, money, resources, personnel, right? Because all those things, those energy and hard work that's needed to implement the program, you, you need those factors, right? You need adult mentors in your building. That, that are willing to spend the time and, and go to the meetings and participate and connect with kids and do that. You need the money in order to implement some of that. You need, um, you need the time, right, to be able to say, hey, this is a priority. This is a priority. We need to set aside time within our school day, potentially after school, uh, in order to implement this. So all of those factors that you mentioned. I don't know if you can think of some others, but I know that those are definitely factors that you're talking about. And I know I kind of came in midstream. Have you already given us the punchline? Is this something that uh, in well, terms we of the recommendation? The, okay, I'm sorry. Then we, we haven't gotten to the bottom line well, yet. But just, just let me add one thing. Uh, how, how much time does it take, in like sixth grade, how much time does it take to? So the way that we implemented it at West last year, and it's kind of similar at North Carroll this year, is um, the, the adult mentors and the peer leaders meet about every other week, about twice a month. Um, at West, we did it for an hour. We found it was too long, so I'm reaping the benefits of doing it one year than the next. Um, so we do it 45 minutes, um, twice a month. And so for some, we, we do like an extended flex period. I don't know if you're familiar with flex, but we do an extended flex period. Um, and so the other students are in flex, doing, getting those other interventions while we're having, running the program. And teachers who's planning it is, we're able to pay them hourly to plan after school to be a, still be a part of the program. So it's about an hour and a half like of the school day each month taken out, but then there's a lot of behind the scenes work happening as well. You know, getting the campaigns ready, getting things organized, and flexing kids to make videos and things like that to kind of get the word out. So it's hard, depending upon the month and the campaign, it depends. You know, um, the two adult people, the two teachers that are in charge of the program are probably working probably 15 hours a month on it outside of their school day. And then transportation becomes an issue, like North Carroll for after school. We try to do everything during the school day. So, we, and that was kind of recommendation from from NAMI um, last year. So that we're not excluding any any student group that, that wanted to be involved or that should be involved. So we have to do pretty much everything during the school day, and that's how we're continuing it. There may be some things and opportunities for after school that but would not impact anyone's involvement in being, you know, just maybe like some arts and craftsy things to get things ready on a wall or something like that. But we're trying to focus everything within the school day so we are not excluding anyone from the program. Unless you have a girls and boys club to rely on. Right? That, would, well, that will bust them home. <laughs> so, Ed, going back to the suicide rate and Commissioner Howard's question, <clears throat> of the suicides that we had, how many of them were through something like firearms versus drug overdoses? The, the the ones the suicides that we've had have, uh, and I'm I'm trying to, to think specifically, but they, they are generally through firearms and things like that. But but that's not the sole focus of this. I know the, this program is a, a suicide prevention program, but it's a positive mentoring program, and that's what we're we're focusing on. Because I, I guess I'm looking at it from the standpoint of when um, Commissioner Howard came and talked to us, and Commissioner Wentz has talked to us about what the commissioners want to do. We, we, we've been talking about the fact that we've got all these things that we're trying to do from an intervention standpoint once people become addicted. We're trying to do something to prevent people from getting to that point. And, and, and regardless of what the, you know, the suicide rate numbers are what, the, what they are, and, and they're not, they're not drug-related suicides from what I can recall in discussing this with our nursing director who reviews all, all, the, uh, all the 
the uh, <laughs> child deaths in the, in the county. But, uh, you know, we're, talk we're talking about having the ability to have positive mentors, to have people that can interact with kids to, to, to help them with problems that they're having that might lead to suicide or, you know, you know might lead to drug addiction. It, it's, they're, they're, this is that whole overall behavioral health picture that we're talking about, and it's not just limited to this or, opi you know, suicide, opioid addiction, suicide attempt, anything of that nature. It's, it's, it's trying to make a positive Im impact on whether it's suspensions in the school that we wind up measuring, that we, we have fewer suspensions or something of that nature. Those are the kind of things that we're trying to do overall have an impact on positive behavior uh, uh, amongst the students and, and helping them to make the right decisions as they so, but I, 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 I buy that, but I just want to say something. Doug, come back to your question. There's a, I just pulled up an article from the American um, Journal for Psychiatric Health dated 2017. It talks about urban rural differences in suicide within Maryland. And basically the conclusion is that although rural areas have higher rates of suicide on firearms, our rates of suicide are no higher in all other areas. And the conclusion says, quote, you know, access, basically what it says, I'll just paraphrase, uh, male, fi male access to firearms drives the increased rate of suicide in rural areas. Now, I, 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 I don't want to take anything away from what Ed is saying and, and what Amy's saying, because I think this idea of sources of strength is good. But I do want to say this. I mean, we started off with this being an opioid thing, and now it's morphing into something more generic. If that's what the Board of Commissioners wants to do, that's fine. But this clearly is moving in a direction of basing first quoting statistics about suicide, we find out they're mostly all firearm related, and this was supposed to be opioid treatment, so what are we doing? Just want to make sure we're doing what we well, want to be doing. Just because, <laughs> just because the, the suicides were caused by a firearm doesn't mean that the underlying cause wasn't drugs. Just because they used a firearm to commit the suicide doesn't mean that that's what put, that something else didn't push them, obviously something else pushed them to that point, and you have no way of knowing whether that was drug abuse or something else in the family, so therefore, why that statistic is good for that article, it doesn't really, you can't really say that's, that, that's, that's <coughs> the, because we have access to the firearms, that's what is, what's well, causing it. I, I, right, I don't but buy we're that. supposed to be treating opioid deaths, not firearm deaths, I thought. If well, we I, change the agenda, that's fine. If it's no, it, it's, it's, you didn't hear what I said then. Well, well, I did, but you're just, that's well, your supposition and speculation. If I could that's enter. from 39 years of teaching, so it's not just my, my uh, speculation. Older. I don't think you can I know, separate I, I out. I, I, and I, I was I'm sorry say, to interrupt. I, yeah, but I don't think you can separate on. one out from the other. I guess yeah, is what yeah. I'm saying. It's well, and I, and that I think, overall picture we need to be looking at. Right. I think you know, and when you're describing some of the things that are likely uh, things that maybe you know add to the the likelihood of suicide, as hard as they are to depict, I'm sure if we came up with a similar list, not for you know people that have been over prescribed and those kinds of things, but but folks that seek sort of kind of an alternative existence, uh, if you will, to what the, what the reality is, the list would probably look very similar. I would imagine it would have an awful lot of, of overlap, right? I mean, I think right. I think the other thing is, and, and I understand the concern, Commissioner Rachel, I think you're, you're right in that we need to kind of stay focused, but I, I think what I hear you saying, when you look at the range of options for what we're trying to do within the scope even of the opioid issue, this is a good solution. There may be some other good byproducts of that as well. Um, but at the end of the day, one of the things I think this does is, and, and, and it, I, I think it's something that we have to look at long term as a way of kind of dealing with this, the idea that we're going to send anybody away, any group, any task force, any, to solve this problem and come back with a solution is just incredibly uh, wrong thinking. It's just, it's just not the way it's going to be. To me, if we get any sort of a handle on any sort of a piece that sort of shrinks, if anything else, it might highlight strategies that we need in other areas to address those issues that haven't shrunk. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and I, I just think this is so multifaceted and so ingrained and so challenging that, you know, we, and really, let's face it, I mean, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's a step, but, it, you know, we could spend tens of millions, and I don't think we could confidently say that you know, even with that level, with no constraints on time or money, that we could pinpoint this and, and eradicate it. So, I, I, I think that is, we got to look at those best next levers to get down the path of looking for those kinds of opportunities. We we just got to tilt things a little bit in our favor, so this starts to be a little bit more winnable of a fight. Really, I, I hate to put it that way, but that's how. Uh, absolutely. I mean, and, and the message of sources of strength is spreading hope, <coughs> help, and strength. You know, so you know, I, I don't. 
just knowing kids and doing this for 25 years, you know, um, not 39, just 25, but, um, <laughs> but, but just, just giving them that hope and that help. And then th these are, these are um, s um, scientifically d determined, you know, what those sources of strength are that people go to when they change a choice, you know. Um, when you think about that, and we, give, we start building those three things in our kiddos, then there's a strong possibility maybe they wouldn't go to opioids or they might not go to drinking or to suicide or to you know, some other type of risky behavior. You know? So if we can start at a young age building hope, health, and strength, then you know, I, I wish I had a crystal ball, I really do, um, but, but maybe we can end up with, with better statistics on the screen. I guess and you know, you know? Because the only reason we went down this path is, sure. is because yep, we absolutely. started this presentation with discussions of suicide rates and we're finding out that the prima facie evidence we have is that they were firearm related, not opioid. And, and according to our briefing, the issue here is proposing use of this money committed for opioid issues. And I'm just trying to figure if we've got, if, maybe we should change the, agent, the, the issue to, to, to opioid and other issues that relate, that, that create uh, circumstances for youth suicide. But Right now, we're going, we, we use the justification, as far as I'm concerned, has no validity relative to the mission, which was opioid treatment. I, that's all I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying that maybe that's the direction we should go, but right now, that's not what this money was earmarked for. It was specifically earmarked for opioid-related deaths, and the, and the statistics do not prove that these were opioid-related deaths. That's all. No, but and, this and is the suicides or not. Um, and let me just just add too that uh, you know I, I think focusing on while while the commissioners dedicated this money to opioid funding I think for us to try to look at that as the as, as a single issue it's it's an impossible task because we we have uh, just as many deaths I, I can't remember but the numbers are staggering is the number of alcohol related deaths <laughs> that we have in, in in this in this county. Um, and, and the number of alcohol overdoses that we see in our emergency department. These behaviors are all related. And, and if we're going to do a prevention program to try to keep people from having opioid uh, problems, it's going to affect all these other behavioral health issues as well. It's, it's, it, you can't just single out opioids when, when you're talking about doing prevention. Now, I mean, if we want to get into specifically doing interventions for for opioid things, which I think there, there's a lot of money out there at the state level and the federal level that everybody's trying to focus on this, on this s small piece of the problem. As I look at it, it's a it's a big problem, but it's just a small part of the problem that we're facing in our society. I, I just don't think that you can get to the root of it by just trying to focus on that one drug. Well, I think the other thing also is that we know that, you know, I mean, to me, it's bigger than just dealing with the issue of opioid deaths. It's dealing with the opioid problem, even though. A lot of the measure for that manifests itself in you know in the tragic losses that, that we see. The problem with things like fentanyl and things like that, as you all know, is any usage, you know, it's like Russian roulette. I mean, right? So I mean, right. it's not a matter of you know we've got to wait till someone's such a high level user that they are more of a, a candidate for overdose. Right? One use could, could could end up in a death, and some of that's I hate to put it this way, but some of it's luck of the draw in terms of what you're what actually you getting. Yep. Right, and so the so the reality becomes that you know we've got to look at, at ways to reduce the opioid uh, usage, the the, the 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 existence of it, whether or not it ends up in a death or not. I, I bet those statistics are less correlated, and I think that came up in one of our discussions. They're less correlated to excussive drug use as they are, or maybe it was in a discussion with the sheriff, but or maybe no, it was it was a you discussion guys are both. We yeah, support of yeah, but that it's it's more about those outside factors. But right. the factor is, I mean, by any statistic, if we can reduce even by some significant percentage the yeah. folks that are out there using in whatever way, we also reduce that same percentage of folks that are going to lose in that Russian roulette game. Yeah. All right? So Commissioner, why don't you continue? Just, oh, go ahead. I say, why don't you continue with your sources of strength presentation, and then we can yeah, discuss and, it after and that. Just, and the sources of strength are purely, we wanted to, we, we promised you, Ed and I did when we were here last time, that we would make um, our engagement to get these folks. And the key, the key is upstream. Now, while the statistics of death by gun and suicide, um, certainly we, we shouldn't look at that in total. What we should look at is we're trying to get a program that engages children all across this county. And right now, our best avenue to do that is a program that's been piloted because what we really want to do is give the children of Carroll County avenues to make good choices, to not make risky choices. 
And again, uh, you know, Commissioner, you're correct in that we know about the suicides. They pop up. We see those in stats. What we all don't know about today is how many children in our schools are already engaging in risky behaviors. And if we are able to roll out this type of program, we might be able to wind them back. We might be able to pull them back into what we need. So we also looked at, this is the FY19 funding, the, what we can do as one time to engage, engage fast, and start to turn this ship around. Because it's not gonna turn. You know, you can't turn a ship in one, one steer. We're trying to get it in a multitude of different ways, and this is just one piece of that. And you'll hear in the other presentations the rest of what we hope to try to um, so, engage. So let me respond. First of all, I, I don't yes, disagree sir. with that. And I sure. agree with Commissioner Howard that, there's, that, that this is, a, in all of you, that's a broader issue. But right. if, in fact, all the suicides we had were firearms related, minors can't buy firearms in Maryland, okay? Right. Then where's the portion of the program that encourages our parents to keep their firearms under lock and key? Where's that portion? You see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm sorry, sometimes we just, we, we miss the obvious in pursuit of the obscure. Mm -hmm. But that's the obvious solution. Don't let kids have access to your firearms. Well, yeah, but we didn't send them off on a course to deal, deal with the suicide issue. We dealt them, we sent them off in the direction to deal with the drug issue. I think what, we're, what they're saying is there's a benefit to that, but these are also, I mean, if we successfully implement this and don't positively impact the opioid situation, that would be surprising, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be, well, our expectation is that these kinds of attributes should be things that yes. work in our favor. We have all sat and talked about empowering our youth to be able to tell us things. The other thing that we don't know because we don't tell children is, if mom and dad are having risky behaviors at home, and, and that would be, you know, come tell your peer mentor at the school. Let us then engage some help to get you help at home so that you don't partake in that risky behavior. Could lead to exactly what you said, Commissioner Rothschild. They might not even, perhaps at home, they, they're not locking up their firearms, they're not doing the things that they, they should be doing as parents. And that, we hope, will also empower these children to speak up at school, which is sometimes the only place where these kids get good adult supervision in some cases. That, and, that's it. And and I, that's I, now, I will say anecdotally, I do know of circumstances where kids have been in situations where they chose not to speak up yep. because they did not want to be the source of mom or dad getting arrested sure. or mom. And, and, and I, I do think as part of this education process, there's got to be a way to communicate, mm -hmm. you know, and I know it's very hard to do, but when you encounter those situations, you know, the next stop is not to, you know, um, because I don't think it is. I think there's a lot of mechanisms that go into it. But I think that's a lot of what kids have mm -hmm. in their minds is that they're going to be the cause of, you know. Get mom and dad in trouble. Right. And, and then from there, either A, one of two things happen. Either now I'm not in the environment that I wanted to be in, which could be more concerning to me, or B, the system doesn't do some of what it needs to do, and now I'm in a really bad situation where, you know, parents, you know, I mean, you hope they don't hold that against their children, but I don't think that's always the case either. So I, I think that's, that's one of the biggest challenges, get, making sure they understand that if they, ask, if they act on those impulses as much as we want them to, that there's sort of a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a safe way of doing that in as much as there can be. Right. But. From, a, from a behavioral health standpoint, I'll just add it. If all the guns were locked up and people couldn't commit, kids couldn't commit suicide, obviously something's driven them to the point where they're unhappy enough with their life that they're going to do something else, whether it's seek drugs, seek alcohol, do, do something else that, that's going to get them away from whatever it is that's, that's making their life miserable for them that they would, would lead them to commit suicide. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about trying to change behaviors and, and have those positive interactions with the, with the kids so we can have a positive because the, cause the core issue, the I mean, building. these aren't accidental. But the core issue is, is that they've, they've come to the mental conclusion that not being here is better than being here. The means by which that occurs that the nail on the head. is really, you know, it's not that it's inconsequential, right. but it's not the root cause of the problem. Right. So. so getting to the bottom line, commissioners, you were, you were asking, um, what we're looking for is uh, it would take about five to $10,000 in the spring to uh, bring sources of strength staff out here to work <clears> with our community to evaluate the programs that we, we have presently going on in the schools and to try to uh, get the community involved and, and, and get other people motivated to expand, expand these programs. We would be looking for 
uh, $13,000 to train trainers in the Carroll County Public Schools. Right now, in order for people to get trained, we have to send them to uh, sources of strength certified trainers. We'd like to have our own trainers here in the school system that would help us with expanding this program. And then in the fall, uh, $20,000 would be used because once those trainers are trained, they have to be evaluated by somebody who, who, who will uh, essentially validate their, their training. We would, we would bring folks out here to evaluate them as they're, as they're uh, training additional staff in the, in the school system and evaluating how, how, how that's being done so that they can be fully certified as trainers. And this would give us the capacity to, uh, to have trained folks go around and, and expand this throughout the school system, wherever the school system can support it. Does that, that, is accurate. Does that describe it well? That is so that, that's what the ask is, uh, a total of $43,000. And I don't know if there's, you know, the, the intent was we'd get through this PowerPoint and then we would let uh, the school system folks add anything that they wanted to say about the program because I, I've seen the program just by being out there one day and taking hey, a really look at it. Did you really come here thinking you were going to get through a PowerPoint without well, you know? I, I don't know. Inter without Sometimes, intervention? It depends. That it seems depends very on, uh, <laughs> depends on what kind of day it is. Yeah, I understand. But uh, is there anything that, that you all want to add that, that I didn't say that you think is important to say about the program? Because you've had plenty of opportunity to be asked questions. I don't mind mentioning uh, something uh, here. I've been out to, to all the four schools that are implemented at the moment, and um, I've got to say, at least anecdotally, right, at the moment, um, I see a lot of positive behaviors and enthusiasm by both the adult mentors and, and the peer leaders that are taking place. These individuals are excited to be learning, and, and as you can imagine, we're, we're, um, we're having adult mentors that we know care for kids, that they, they care, they go beyond the curriculum, if you want to say, and they care about kids. And uh, we see that it make making an impact on them personally as well, because we're all humans, right? We all go through tough times and through whatever, and that they're also expanding their own knowledge base about, hey, what can I turn to maybe when I'm going through some tough times? And they're able to actually uh, share that with the kids, which obviously is a huge thing when a kid realizes, hey, adults go through tough times too, and they have something that they can turn to you know, when, when doing this. And then seeing those peer leaders, as I mentioned before, we're looking at a diverse group of kids that are able to um, influence their peer group. So whether it be, for lack of a better word, the drama kids, the athlete kids, the, you, you know what I'm saying, a diverse group of kids, they're able to influence those group of peers, you know what I mean, in terms of, hey, what are some things I can turn to, adult mentors I can turn to when they're, you know, when I'm going through some tough times, some stressful times. And just seeing that kind of play itself out last year, as well as into this school year at the moment, I've had a teacher just recently came out there. I was at one of their meetings, and, and she said, Jim, i got to let you know, I've already seen this program making a positive impact on this school. Sure. That, that, was, that was a comment she made to me as I'm walking out the door. And, and we're only you know, a couple months in, and she's already and she mentioned that to me. And this is a new school that we already mentioned. Well, and I know you used the word anecdotally, and I, I did as well. Um, but I, I, I guess I want to take a step back and say we did encourage you to look for things um, that weren't going to be easy to get funded other places if we were strictly working sort of by the numbers. So um, I you know, appreciate that, um, but um, I, we may find that some of that anecdotal information is just as good, and, uh, and I think we asked you to do that. So that's, that's um, I, don't think, I think that's a good observation. Well, I appreciate the uh, discussion. Are there any more questions about this program before we move on to the next item that's on our list. Is middle school far enough to go with this? Should we it be we in probably elementary? ought to be looking at, at it's, elementary well, schools. It's, on, it's only ahead. a middle and high school program. Is that what so you're asking? Okay. Yeah, okay. it's only designed. There is a grade two to five program, okay. and I'm going to forget the name of it, but there is one that, that NAMI supports, um, but this is just a grade six to 12 program. Okay. And, and the health department is, is per, involved in the curriculum in the uh, elementary schools, in, in the health program, and doing prevention work, we, 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 we're doing age appropriate level uh, intervention with, with that type of thing. While sources of strength we're, we're targeting in the middle school and the high school kids, there are things that are being, being done at other levels and this is just a small, very small piece of the pie and, and I just think that this is a, a, is a very promising program that could really benefit our kids. Do we want to vote on this as each individual thing that comes up or we want to wait to the end? What, what do you guys want to do? to the end, see what else they have to say, and I'll stop interrupting. 
<laughs> All right, if you promise that, we'll go forward. <laughs> All right, give it well, 100000 just for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Hey, All right, thank you. You. you're half to blame. <laughs> Okay, the next one's just basically me uh, talking to you about um, a piece that came up as we were discussing this, uh, is that there's a behavioral health resource guide that's sitting in front of you all. Uh, this has been widely recognized by, by folks in the state as being something that we've done very positively here in Carroll County. It was a cooperative effort that was uh, pulled together by the Partnership for a Healthier Carroll County. Uh, the health department contributed to it and, and the hospital contributed to, to getting these resources together. and. It's being widely used by hospital staff, by private pra medical practices, by our EMS, our law enforcement folks. It, it's, it's, it's being widely used in the community. It's actually, uh, we've been distributing to churches and, and other nonprofit groups that want resources for where do we turn if we have a, a behavioral health issue and what, what's available out there. And I, I think this, uh, uh, this resource guide is just, uh, it's, it's a, uh, um, it's a plethora of information that, that people can turn to, to to figure out what to do if, if they have a specific behavioral health issue and, and, they, and they're looking for resources. Um, the, the partnership printed the first 5,000 of these. Over 4,500 have been distributed to the organizations that I've been talking about. There are less than 500 that are, that are presently left, and we'd like to see it get reprinted, but nobody has the money to reprint it. So with this being one-time funding that as we're looking at it this year we figured this would be an opportunity to ask if the uh, commissioners would be willing to reprint this I think that we certainly the partnership would be open to if the commissioners want to put a message in the guide to go along with the, the things that are already in there or, or put the county logo on there uh, what I would anticipate is the county would 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 ultimately contract it out and reprint it and you could add something to it we, we'd have to coordinate with the partnership to get you the uh, the the, the uh, document so that it, so that it could be put so out. So if for we printing. reprint this, if we reprint this, which it looks like a good public, are we targeting providers or are we targeting people at risk? Because if we're targeting people at risk, then we should change the name of this to something like "I feel depressed and helpless." Who do I call? Now this is this is a resource guide for people who are essentially intervening with these people who are who are having problems. Okay. And whether whether it be an individual or or whether it, it it's mainly going out to organizations that are trying to help folks, whether whether it's, uh, like I said, churches or other community organizations, they're, they're using this guide to try to figure out how to get people to where they need to be in order to, uh, to, to get the help that they need. Okay. So it's targeted towards providers and not at-risk people. Trying to well, break the cycle by using them. That's right. Trying and, to get the providers. And I don't know that it's just providers. It's, it's a whole bunch of other community organizations because the law enforcement folks and, and EMS and, and folks that I've talked to that have these, they, they said they don't they, – they, they make sure that they have it with them at all times because okay. it's just okay. something they can turn to. to answer uh, my question. So, and okay. how many of these would you print? We we print an additional five thousand. Okay. And my suggestion is we 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 get them back to the partnership, and the partnership can continue to get them out to the community organizations. Okay. And and I, I don't know not to be cavalier about about money, and I don't know where you are in the whole of the amount that we put aside, but you know once you get a document like this done, printing more is generally a pretty is a small incremental cost. Um, and I think a lot of times we, we kind of go to our go-to folks. Um, and there's a whole other realm of folks out there, you know, businesses and, and just things like that. So ju just make sure, you know, we're not missing an opportunity. I mean, I don't care if we provide 300 to the chamber and say everybody gets one. You know, I mean, if I got 50 employees, this might be a good thing for me to have on my desk. But yep. just, That's you know. That's a great point. Yeah, but I mean, like once you're printing something, the incremental cost of five to ten thousand, a lot of times is some ridiculously negligible number. So let's just at least make sure we're not missing that opportunity. And it's also available. The best part about it is it's available online. To it folks. is, but I tell you, the the, the plethora like of things that, that are online, thing yeah, hand. as opposed to just going and grabbing the book. I think you know, right? Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. that any questions about that? No. But what would you did you give us a cost on that? Yeah, it's fifteen. We, we're we're estimating fifteen thousand dollars. If oh, if you guys if you guys put it out for for bid and figure out what it costs to print, if it costs less than that, it costs less than that. That's that's what it costs the partnership to print the first five thousand. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're gonna invite Bonnie up to join us because we're gonna talk about wanting to pilot a uh, smart moves program in the uh, 
in the existing Westminster Boys and Girls Club. Good afternoon. <laughs> funny. Good afternoon. So, so, you know, it's funny. When we were sitting, we, we sat and talked briefly before we came in to, to speak to you as the Board of <clears throat> Commissioners. And, and I look at this as, as uh, being very similar to trying to do something similar to what we're trying to do with the middle school kids with the, uh, with, with, with the Sources of Strength program. And, and, uh, but this is uh, using the existing Boys and Girls Club to try to deal with kids who are, who are 10 to 15 years old to have those same types of interventions where we're going to try to prevent them from having risky behaviors. Um, I stuck a, a sheet up there that's a two-pager that explains what the goal of this program is, and I'll let Bonnie go ahead and talk a little bit more about it. Um, all of you know how I am so in tune to our teens, and I think we have a real issue with our teens. And with the new club that we have, that was a major focus for our new club was to be able to accept more teens as well as our younger children. But teens are where we're really having an issue. I've never seen so much, so many kids delusional about, about hope for their future, for what's going on in their lives. At least with the Boys and Girls Club, we have so many um, adult mentors that are with the kids every day and with doing this particular program just with the teens in small groups. We learn a lot about what's going on in their lives, what they're facing, how they're feeling. I've heard so much about suicide talk with our teens. Starting at such a young age, I'm really floored about it, and I think we need to move quickly about it. And a lot of it has to do with the drugs at home, what's happening in their family lives, things like that. But they don't have hope for a future. They don't think they're worth anything. And our major focus is to have those adult volunteers that will be the same volunteers throughout this program and get to the bottom of what's going on with our kids and what's in their heads and know that it's a safe place. And that's what's good about the Boys and Girls Club. They know when they come in the club, it's a safe place. You can talk about anything, you can ask anything, you can be anybody. <coughs> and to us, that's very important with our culture, as you know. And I think we can get down to the root of the issues that many of our kids have with these adult mentors. And it's a program we haven't run before, but Smart Moves, it's, it's a holistic approach. It's not just about drugs or alcohol or firearms, um, teen <laughs> behavior, what's going on, what's appropriate, what isn't. We're focusing on a whole group, and it's going to be about leadership, career development, healthy lifestyles, and how it affects them. So each one will have a plan for their future, even if it's only going into the next year of school. We just think that's very important for them. So what's nice, though, at the Boys and Girls Club, we can do surveys and see what they're thinking, their change in thinking, where they're moving on and what differences. And whoever is very positive in this program, it goes on to the next generation of our kids that are coming through. Because what's important now that's happening with our teens, they're so excited about the Boys and Girls Club, what they're learning. They think it's their second home. It's safe. They are now having their friends come to the Boys and Girls Club. Now we're the cool place and while we're the cool place we want to work with our kids as much as we possibly can with that and as you all know maybe not but last week we started we opened Tuesday and Friday nights now so that our teens can come be there till 10 o'clock at night and their friends are welcome as well they don't have to be members of the Boys and Girls Club they're their friends so we have very organized and you know adult supervision for that but I think it's a good place to pilot it and I want you to know once we pilot it get all the bugs out, see what works, what didn't, what we need to add to it. We plan on sustaining this program moving forward in the Boys and Girls Club. Is this so, a program that's already out there or is this a program that you're developing? No, it's out. some of it's out there at Boys and Girls Club as a program. We have not financially brought it into our club. Okay. So it's a pilot for us and then we're gonna add some more to the curriculum. And I think every area is different. It sure. might be a Boys and Girls of America program but we all face different things in our community and with our kids. And now so that's is, why we want to focus on it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sure. Um, so this is for existing members of the Boys and Girls Club. It is, and those that are coming in daily will be put into the program that are teens, strictly okay. for the teens. Okay. We have, what we're doing is targeting the 50 teens we have right now. That's how much we've exploded. Right. We have 50 of them, and we're going to do it over a six-month period of time. Okay just so we get the pilot done, and then we're going to expand it okay. as we move forward. Because eventually we'd like to also go into start with elementary. 
and okay. move forward. So is that expansion within your facility? I know at one point one of the discussions was how do we actually get you guys out and maybe even use some of the school facilities. I want to make sure we're, at, we're expanding our, not, not to take away from the impact oh, yeah, you guys absolutely. are making, but I want to expand our reach. Is this going to do that? Is this going to pilot that? Where does it go from here? The way we're thinking as a club yeah. is to pilot it where we are because it's more of a controlled atmosphere sure. so we can get better results. Okay. But we are thinking of other programs that we might expand eventually, hopefully in 2019. We're looking at it with many people of maybe taking two other middle schools out of our Westminster area and running the Smart Moves program there. Okay. Okay. But we want to make sure we get all the glitches out right. and make sure it's fun for kids. The talk is out there. No, no, I, I'm, I'm yeah. all for pilots. But we are, yeah. we are planning on but that. But then we also have some challenges in some outside of Westminster Absolutely. areas as well. Absolutely. And with transportation is an issue. I mean, would this be the kind of thing that maybe, maybe it might be easier for us to be mobile than for all the kids to be mobile if it was, you know, I don't know. What we're thinking is a very running. short pilot program in other schools as we move forward, depending yeah. on how this goes. Yeah. And we would have staff hired to go into those schools for those children. Mm -hmm. But be able to do more of a whole program of what we offer. Because no one's going to come, ooh, a Smart Moves program, ooh, a drug abuse right, program. It's have you know to what be I mean? More so it would be a Boys and Girls Club right. teen program. So if this goes well, how do we get from here to there? If this goes well, right now, actually, we're already writing grants and things and talking to funders to expand. Okay, but we have some unused resources. And too. we would love here on unused resources. Well, I'm sure you would. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah. but, I but mean, how do we, a, we wanted to do this first. We didn't want to do, put too much on the plate. Um, but we probably would come back to, to see who else could help fund us for those schools. And, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to link this to what we want to do right. with, the, with the ongoing funding because my concern is, is I, we have some, one of the ideas that we, we probably want to pitch at some point in time is trying to do something in other schools throughout the county. But okay. I don't think we can limit it to the Boys and Girls Club. I think that as, as, as local government, you, you probably want to open it up to see Something who broader would, in scope. You, okay. you, you, right. you, you, yeah. you put out an RFP and you see who gives you the best proposal okay. for the money that well, you might that's, be offered. That's fair enough. I just, in as much as I think adding to what we're doing yeah. is great. Um, I also know in, in, in one respect, you're, you're getting your arms around some of these kids. Yes, and so I always want to be thinking about, you know, who are the kids we, we can't get our arms around, you know, right. not, not to take away no, from no, doing I, what you're doing. No, I understand completely. Yeah, so I just think as long as our eyes are on, you know. And ours are on expansion. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, we, and, we and yours are too in other ways. Yeah. We, we realize that, you know, when we come back in, in the next, when we come back and talk about what we want to see ongoing, it, we're looking outside of just Westminster. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's definitely on our radar screen. But again, I, I don't want to link it specifically to that's Boys fine. and Girls Club because yeah. I think we need to be fair as to, as to how we would, you know, if the county's going to put money towards something, that, that it be open to people yeah. giving proposals and we figure out what's best for, for uh, what the need is. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I just think in as much as we're trying to pilot things, we want to make sure that when we get to the end of the pilot, we can say, we okay, here? more of that, less of that. This is reproducible. Right. And I, I do think because of the concentration, Westminster is always sort of a normal place to look at things. But we also know with limited transportation, there's stuff we're just going to have to put other places if we're going to really affect. We plan on taking it there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions for <coughs> Bonnie? No, no questions? Your presentation was so great, it was unbelievable. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Sure. So thank much. Thank you. Lynn? Come on down. Yeah, the, the total cost for that proposal is, is, uh, is $25,000 to pilot the program. And um, I've actually got a breakdown if, if uh, it's, it's, a, it's about $12,000 in staffing, and then there's transportation, field trips, uh, program development, and whatnot. If, uh, I do have a question about that. Is that uh, one-time money or is that the uh, ongoing? It's one-time money. As, as Bonnie said, they're they're gonna they're gonna try to, you know, keep this going in their existing boys and okay. girls club. This is uh, this is to kind of pilot it and see how it goes and tweak it and. Uh, gotcha. Okay. So, are you gonna ask parents if they want their children to participate at the boys and girls club before just oh, thanks, you know, putting parents in Parents are advised in any program at all that we do, especially with our teams, and they sign. Yep. 
Okay, uh, the, the next one has to do with uh, our um, ACT team, which is definitely very, very focused on, uh, on the opioid problem and dealing with uh, people who have persistent mental health and substance use needs and, and trying to provide transportation. I'm, I'm not gonna say a lot about it because I think Lynn could do more justice to talking about what their need is than I can. Thank you, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, just a, a recap on the assertive community treatment team. Um, this program serves uh, the most challenging and seriously mental ill um, people in the community, also people with significant substance use. Um, this program tries to keep people out of the hospitals, out of the detention centers, um, helps people in their recovery, and, um, and helps them to stabilize into um, a life that they consider worth living. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the conditions of this program and where we get our funding is that most of the services occur in the community, so it truly is a mobile treatment team. Um, at least 80% have to be in the community. We think that we probably provide about 90% in the community. Um, uh, patients do come in to see the psychiatrist, but they're transported in by our therapist. These aren't folks who can um, manage a car, afford a car, or even afford transportation services. So, um, so it truly is a program that meets vehicles. Um, just to let you know that we did have uh, a fundraiser at the Chocolate Ball last year and we were able to raise $15,000, which um, uh, provided us with a used van. So we have one. Um, we have another program, Connecting Youth, that we presented to you a little bit earlier. Uh, we just wrote a grant for that program and we're able to get a, a small car for that program. Um, but in assertive community treatment, we have 87 clients and we have about 18 staff currently. And the staff are now using, I mean, they always have used their own vehicles. Um, when we have a vehicle, you all have been so kind and generous, we go through the county for maintenance, we go through the county for our, our gas purchases, which really, that I have to say, help our organization financially as well. So there's lots of reasons why um, um, we could use another vehicle. Um, so, I mean, they, we give them transportation to everywhere, every doctor's appointment, be it Baltimore City, be it in Carroll County. We take them food shopping to group sessions. Pretty much everything they go to that is necessary for their lives, we're taking them to. So, um, not to give you too much information, but using one's personal vehicle isn't always the way that they want to go. Um, we have folks who have difficulties because of where they live with, with bed bugs, with roaches, you know, that kind of thing. So them using their own vehicles is, um, is something that we'd like to avoid whenever we can. Um, this one van is constantly on the move, so they're signing it out um, whenever they go um, with someone who needs lots of uh, space to move them from one apartment to another or lots of space to pick up uh, food baskets that they bring to our clients so um, so so we have fully used our our new van which we're very thankful for so we're here um, and and um, we do serve a number of people with um, with opioid use um, sadly we've lost a few clients to opioid use um, whether it's the fentanyl issue or we had a client not too long ago had stopped using. Um, and this is a primary goal of the ACT program to help folks who were using all kinds of um, alcohol, drugs, and opioids to, um, to begin to recover from that illness. And um, sadly, we had somebody who had gone a long time without using heroin and went back, and so at this point, we don't know whether it was fentanyl or whether it was just using the same dosage that they used the last time, which can lead to instant death, of course. So um, so I put 25,000 on there. Um, I think we can get a new van for 30, but even if we got one that was a couple years younger than the one we bought, it would you know, start a cycle of 
attrition with the van so we wouldn't be replacing all at the same time. And I just want to clarify, I put actually uh, $20,000 on the briefing paper because I thought that's where Lynn told me the cost point was. Yes. But so, but if, if, if the commissioners were to approve the $25,000, we're still under, well, nope, that would put us slightly over the, uh, the 115 that's remaining. So there, there's really only, uh, if you approve the other uses, there's, I think that leaves, it gives you 7, trying to left. add it up. 43 and 15, 25. I think there's only 23,000 left. Or, or 20, 20, 22,000 it would be. You have 115, right? 115. I'm sorry. You, you have 7,000 left. Out you have plenty left. Yeah, so you, so, so you have enough to cover that if, if, yeah. uh, if you were to approve the 25. I, I just wanted to do the math to make sure we weren't exceeding what you all set aside. And I do apologize. Ed is correct. I talked him down from the 25 saying, we don't need a new van. We can do it. The, and I was telling my board, and they said, well, you can at least get one that's a couple years younger <laughs> than the one you have now. So anyway. Um, don't we have vehicles we're getting rid of? Um, usually they're pretty much at their end of life. Or any, any of I thought we were trading out some vehicles. Oh. When you take, they, they, um, all going back to the uh, oh, okay, all right, okay, all right. <clears throat> and when you take in folks, Lynn, are you doing basically? Is that one at a time? I mean, is it a? You know, I mean, when you're using the vehicle for transport, are you transporting one person at a time, or is it multiple people, or is um, it? Sometimes it's one person at a time, but um, but we have groups. We have four groups in the agency that a person will go out in in a van and pick up everybody that's needed for that group mm. I mean literally everything we take them to it has to be gotcha. uh, um, but I mean yeah if you wanted to do something smaller we could certainly use it um, the van we use um, and it's just a minivan it's yeah. not a big van yeah. oh. but um, like I said for for moving folks which they do frequently yeah. um, for the pickup from the rescue mission of food baskets once a week for uh, and again transporting groups of people in for yeah. Counseling. Okay. And you have not presented us with a bad project here yet. I mean, they're all good. They're all positive. Uh, I love the education. I love the all the programs you have. Each one is going to be needed in this community. Uh, with that being said, can we vote on these as a group? Sure. Now, Ed, do we, this this will round out the three hundred thousand that we it, pretty much give managed. a few thousand dollars back to you all, but uh, I think we're done. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Two thousand. Right. Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll be back to our next budget session to talk about what what we're proposing for 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 the upcoming year. So I think for for this fiscal year we're finished. Yeah. All right. If, if um, you want to, if I may, if you want to um, change the the YSB part to yeah. from twenty. Right. That would be the only change we'd make on the staff record. Okay. Right. So I'm that would be at, that puts it at 108,000 with 7,000 coming back to the county, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, 7,000 not used yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll move the Board of Commissioners approve the proposed use of the remaining county funding committed to opioid use issues for fiscal year 2019 with uh, up to 108,000 with a $25,000 for the uh, purchase of the Youth Service Bureau uh, vehicle. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Right. That's a really great job, folks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yep. It took a while, but we got through it. Yeah. Thank you. Next up is Environmental Environmental Advisory Council um, briefing. Tom DeVilvis, Brenda Dine. and others. Travel with too much stuff. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Why don't you introduce everyone that's up here with you? So if you don't mind. I am here today with members of our Environmental Advisory Council. We have Frank Bleck, who is our chair, Craig Piskoski, who is the vice chair, and Jesse Drummond. And we are here today because we have three items on the 2018 work plan that have been completed that we want to present to you. We have the expanded polystyrene reduction report, 
the community solar report as well as the status of the Soul Smart designation application. So we are, we are going to start with the expanded polystyrene. Um, today we're here only looking, we're, this is an informational presentation, the only action we're asking for from you on the two reports would be to, um, for your concurrence, to allow, uh, allow us to make them public and to put them up online. And then um, any other action that you may want to take, we'll just wait for further direction from the board when, when you're ready. So I am going to just go ahead and turn it over to um, Frank Bleck and Craig Toskoski to present the expanded polystyrene report for you. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for having us here today. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start off and pass the uh, baton here to Craig, and then I'll finish up on the uh, EPS. Uh, we're here to brief you on the expanded polystyrene foam, or EPS. Uh, you should have the report in front of you, so we're just going to go over a quick, quick review here today um, with what we've come up with in the report. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Frazier had requested we take a look at uh, ways to reduce um, EPS in the Carroll County. Um, you as a board concurred at the joint meeting you had with us back in January of last year to pursue this. Uh, we've been working on it pretty much uh, since January of um, this past year. Uh, it was included in our 2018 work plan. Uh, the EAC did research on the topic. We heard presentations from various groups and individuals and we finalized our report which you have in front of you. Um, I'd like to make it clear that uh, for everyone that the uh, Carroll County Board of Commissioners do not have any proposal on the table yet regarding this. And the EAC in this report has not um, made any recommendations uh, to tell you one way or another what to do. We've simply presented um, things you can do and some of the ramifications. Uh, basically, with EPS, we're talking about um, two main things, single-use foodware and also the foam packing peanuts. They're the basic subjects of the report. Um, the biggest focus and the one I think uh, causes the most um, issues with people is the foodware, the single-use foodware. I'm going to turn it over to Craig now, and he's going to continue uh, briefing on the report. Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, expanded polystyrene is recyclable. Um, although part of the problem with it, including it in the recycling stream, is that it gets uh, contaminated by food items, um, those food um, carry-out food trays that we talked about, um, reduces the amount of recycling there. Um, uh, Carroll County has been proactive. Um, it's also difficult to include in the single stream system because it, it breaks apart in smaller pieces. Uh, blows around, contaminates other items, blows into the environment. Um, Carroll County's been proactive in having a drop-off uh, center at Northern Landfill, uh, which last year collected 11,000 pounds of expanded polystyrene. Uh, that program operates through the Dart Corporation, <coughs> which collects it and processes it and recycles it. Um, Dart also uh, operates a, its own separate drop-off facility at their distribution uh, warehouse in Hampstead, which collects roughly more than 100 pounds each year. Um, as far as the, the waste stream, uh, expanded polystyrene uh, doesn't account for much as far as weight in the waste stream. It's about 1%, but because um, it's so lightweight, uh, it takes up more in volume than it does by weight. Um, that being said, um, in the environment, uh, it doesn't biodegrade, which is also uh, part of the reason uh, to look at um, reduction. Uh, it lasts thousands of years in the environment, and it breaks down and becomes part of the um, uh, food chain, um, being absorbed by aquatic life, animals, and uh, bivalves. Um, there are health concerns uh, for as far as human consumption. The National Research Council uh, has recognized it as a uh, styrene, as a potential carcinogen uh, for human consumption. Uh, the FDA hasn't really taken a position whether to endorse it or ban it, but it does recommend that uh, people do not heat up their food 
in expanded polystyrene containers because of fear that it leaches into bad food items. Um, to the extent that it's uh, prevalent, the Environmental Waste Group uh, study uh, determined that 40% uh, of Americans have a significant uh, amount of styrene in their system. Some of it can be natural. There's uh, cinnamon and coffee beans and certain items have a very low level of it. Jurisdictions, there's, um, uh, recently there's been an uh, increasing number of jurisdictions that have um, uh, taken measures to ban polystyrene or restrict its use. Um, the ones that are listed there are several counties, Montgomery and Prince George's, uh, 2016, I believe. So they've, they've been able to get some feedback. Uh, not on that list is Washington, D.C., which approved a ban in 2016. And just this past year, uh, or just past month in October, Annapolis City also passed a similar uh, ban on carry-out food containers and single-use plastics. Um, most of that, uh, these uh, bans have met with uh, tremendous <coughs> compliance. Um, Montgomery County reported, uh, most of them are, are driven by complaint-oriented. They're enforcement, uh, only if a citizen, you know, would call the county's attention to a facility or a restaurant not using um, an alternative. Um, in Montgomery County, out of 38,000 uh, establishments that were affected by their ban, uh, they issued four citations. So there's been almost complete compliance with, with bans. Um, there's, uh, as part of that, uh, there was a phase-in um, uh, time which was consistent in all those uh, programs uh, to allow restaurants to find alternative products to use. Um, some of those jurisdictions also included uh, lists of alternatives uh, to help uh, restaurants and other organizations find alternatives. Um, with those alternatives, though, there's costs. Um, EPA, uh, EPS is um, cheap. And it's, it's why, obviously, why a lot of restaurants and facilities use it, because it's it's cheaper than uh, compostable or recyclable material in many cases. Um, uh, but that depends on the type of uh, product you're you're using, and that can vary, and also the amount of uh, the cost of scale that you're you're purchasing. Uh, for instance, like uh, a particular cups, um, Tacoma Park reported that uh, alternative. Products, a compostable cup is maybe two cents more than a polystyrene cup. Um, it's more expensive for um, the takeout containers okay. um, to replace the food trays that the, our, our school system uses um, uh, on a daily basis in the cafeterias would be almost twice as much to use a compostable product. But they went to a food tray that you could reuse, a washable food tray, it would be a one-time upfront cost, and it, therefore it wouldn't, I mean, I don't know if you looked into that, but it's a one-time cost, then they can use those for years and years. It would be, but there are costs associated right, with, with the machines and yes, the hot water and all that stuff. I, yes. Yeah, it's true. Well, how are they getting them back? What do you mean? Well, I mean, I go buy fried chicken and take yeah. it home. How do they get it back? You talk about schools, right? I'm, I'm talking the about school schools. Oh, school oh, system oh, uses schools, okay. 1.4 million get them back as a kid take trays them that they dispose of. <laughs> okay. They previously had the sink, the um, reusable the reusable system with trays. the dishwashers and right. about um, five years ago they yeah. switched as a cost saving measure. Yeah. What would um, some company like Dart that you now it's their living uh, putting these containers out? What would it do to them? a ban on power <coughs> Well, you would think that they're already well aware of um, the prices of these alternatives are coming down because more jurisdictions and, and large companies too, like Dunkin' Donuts and, and McDonald's, have also indicated that they're going to phase out polystyrene cups. Um, DART does manufacture products that are not expanded polystyrene. They have an alternative line of <coughs> eco-friendly products that they can sell as alternatives to these organizations that you know require those do you know the cost difference actually cost difference um some of that is in your is in the report there okay. specifically okay. um 
No, but they're not like, like the no. cups, I think, are three cents difference. Per, per I, I do remember when I was yeah. at the presentation, not the cost difference, mm -hmm. but Dart did say that if this was banned, it's, it wouldn't affect them that much because they make other products and it would just, the other products would be the ones that are, that are sold and bought. Right. So therefore the effect on them is not as great as it would be if they had nothing else to fall back on, but they right. do have other products like that. And if I could jump in there one second too, uh, Craig, on that issue. <clears throat> um, we had a presentation from one of the representatives from DART uh, several months ago and I asked, I posed a question to him um, with the trend going toward uh, reducing EPS nationwide, have you thought or have you begun to look at changing your product line uh, to be in tune with that? He said they have started to look at it. Their biggest concern with the short term was they would have to, I guess, retrofit all their equipment um, to mass produce the new, the new items. So that seemed to be, from what he reiterated to me, their main concern in the short term with them. Um, you know, a reduction and that not being a major part of their product line anymore. I have to also say that, that the representative from DART indicated <clears throat> that the used uh, cafeteria trays from the school system, <laughs> even though that they are soiled, I would call it, with the food, that they would, they, they could still recycle them. He's, but then I heard later that they couldn't, and I'm not sure which is true, which isn't true, because if we could work out if, uh, that the school system could have them dropped off and delivered at, the, at Dart and Hampstead, it'd be a perfect solution for that. We wouldn't have to go to anything else. But I guess it depends, because I heard both things. I don't know what you found well, out about that. After, after that meeting, I, I went back and I asked Maria Myers, our recycling manager, whether she had heard that those kind of trays and, and contamination is still recyclable, and, and her understanding was, that those uh, expanded polystyrene needs to be cleaned in order to, to be recycled. Um, if DART has newer um, processes that can handle those trays, that would be right. I would be excellent to take them up on, on that offer. <laughs> and it could be that you know, what he didn't say is maybe he was assuming then that they needed to be cleaned before they would be recycled, but they, right. maybe they could be cleaned which would add another step to the process. And I don't know whether they do that at their Hempstead facility. Yeah, I was kind of what I got from him was that they needed the product brought to them in a clean, in a clean state. They, they were not accepting dirty EPS and they were not cleaning it okay. themselves. That's what I pretty much got from him. Whether they have the ability to do it and they don't want to, that could be another situation, you know. Didn't hear that from me. Right, that mean, was my understanding. If we're going to clean the cafeteria trays at the school that are styrofoam, why not just clean <laughs> reusable cafeteria trays? Right. This is a very comprehensive report. Very well put together. Uh, no yeah, a couple, couple more <laughs> things more. here. I know we're running short <laughs> on time. So, um, next slide benefits versus disadvantages. I'm not going to go through all of them here. Um, there are Numerous benefits to reducing EPS, uh, especially from an environmental standpoint. Uh, there's also numerous disadvantages. I think most of them, as, as we look through this, uh, are from a cost um, standpoint. Um, you know, a lot more looking at this than just the environmental factor of it. There is, unfortunately, with everything, the monetary uh, factor. I know it's a big cost savings. Well, the other thing too about, you know, we talk about alternatives and some of those alternatives, if they're compostable or um, like the plastic lined coffee cups are, are likely still going to be entering the, the waste system, right? The solid waste stream mm -hmm. uh, because there's no, if we have no system to handle those like compostable items, then they're going to end up the same as uh, EPS really. Right. Yeah. Good point. Uh, possible options to reduce usage, and this is uh, pretty much the nitty gritty of what you guys wanted us to get at. Um, can range anywhere from simple public outreach uh, to a full all out ban on the product. Um, obviously, <laughs> options would include you can mix or match any of these. Uh, we do believe public outreach is probably an option uh, no matter what you pursue. That way the public knows what's going on, why you're doing it, uh, and the reasons for it. Um, voluntary reduction, additional recycling efforts, 
uh, reduced use of EPS at the Carroll County Government and Allied Partner Facilities, Board of Education, uh, passed local legislation to curb EPS, uh, public incentives to reduce the use of it, uh, also explore facilities elsewhere to dispose of EPS. There's some of the options uh, which are in the, the report there. Um, I guess things that you guys, you guys are going to need to do, uh, identify what your goals are in this process. Um, probably is going to need to be a cost benefit analysis and also um, research into the cost for alternative products. Um, all three of these very important things are probably beyond the scope of the EAC. Um, the EAC could help with pu public out outreach materials. If you decide to go that route or whatever route you go with, uh, we would just need direction from you that you want us to do that so we can put on our work plan and uh, take that up. Um, lastly, I'd like to add, uh, we didn't anticipate this going into this whole process, but the farther we got into it, especially when we had presentations from uh, some different groups, this is a very hotly contested topic uh, from both sides. Um, I'd expect no matter what um, route you guys choose to take, <coughs> uh, it's going to be high profile. Um, there's going to be some hot topic discussions on it. Um, several groups, uh, Sierra Club, they're looking at one thing they want. Other corporations like DART, they're looking at another thing. So you have, I think, two polar opposites here um, of what some people uh, are looking at EPS for. So uh, I think you gentlemen are going to have your hands full no matter what you decide to go with here. So uh, anything else we can do for you, just let us know. But um, you have the report there. There's a lot of information, uh, and we'd be happy to um, do the work here for you and give you the information. Anything else, Craig? Brenda? Yeah. I have to say I appreciate all the work that was done on that report. There's a lot that went into it. I thank you for inviting me to the meeting that you had. Sure, with absolutely. the presentation from the different groups and all of that was extremely interesting yeah. and very informative as well. Appreciate you coming. Like I said, once we got into this, it was it got much more involved than what any of us had ever anticipated. So. Usually does. Yeah. It's not as simple. Well, appreciate your work on it very much. Thanks. Yeah. Good. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, turn it over for our next item, the Community Solar and Carroll County Report, and Jesse Drummond will present that uh, item to you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So again, with this one, uh, I understand you guys have the report, so I'm just going to hit on some of the major uh, talking points and big opportunity you guys ask for clarification or, or questions on anything. Um, so I'll just start with on the, uh, on the next slide here. It's just, you know, what is community solar? It, it's not just a buzzword. It's, it comes with specific terms and definitions, assumptions from, based on the Maryland state regulations. And uh, we'll touch on those in a, in a minute. But, um, you know, we might refer to it as community solar. Um, it, there's an acronym, community solar energy generating systems, I think. Um, solar systems already been taken by the astronomers. So we'll say community <laughs> solar, uh, CSEGS. Uh, we are, we're all talking about the same thing here as it uh, relates to how Maryland defines it. Um, and so on, if we go to, uh, yeah, here we go. So, um, you know, what's the point of community solar? Well, it's subscribers um, to, to the energy provided by the facility, um, they get the benefits without having to install it on their property, and um, it credits it credits the value of that energy towards towards their bill. So, um, and uh, if we go to the next one here, so uh, you know, how did EAC start looking at this? We recognized um, that the current county zoning regs and things didn't align with maybe all the opportunities that community solar presents so we requested to take a closer look at it and incorporate it into our uh, 2018 work plan uh, we researched uh, the intricacies of it looked at how it fits into our current zoning uh, regulatory framework uh, in carroll county and, and for maryland uh, we kind of explored some of the advantages disadvantages of um, further action to expand access to community solar and uh, in the report there we compiled uh, more information and kind of a list of some of the potential next steps 
Uh, let's go down that road for the board. Um, go to the next one here. So uh, what's driving this, this bus from a bigger picture? In uh, 2004, Maryland enacted their renewable energy portfolio standard with the goal to increase uh, solar energy to residents and, and the amount of energy pr uh, produced from renewable so resources. And so um, to help achieve that goal, um, you know, as the energy technology is evolving, as the energy markets are evolving, um, they looked at community solar as one of the ways to uh, achieve that, that uh, portfolio goal. So uh, in, t in uh, 2015, they passed some legislation to allow community solar and asked the pu uh, Public uh, uh, Service Commission to establish a pilot program and get some subscriber organizations on board. And so a little bit more about the, the pilot program on the next couple slides here. Um, for Maryland, um, anyone can own one of these uh, given you know, certain limitations, but whether it's individuals, a business, uh, a nonprofit group can, can own and build uh, a facility. And then you need subscribers to, to the energy it produces. So its community is more, at least two or more subscribers to fit the program. And again, that could be a resident, a business, a nonprofit could subscribe um, for a share of that energy and the value. Um, it's got to be connected to, to the grid. You've got to have a meter. Um, again, it's credited towards the bill. And there's some limitations on um, how big of a subscription they can have. So uh, they don't want all large subscribers and then um, they put a cap on, on the facilities at, at two megawatts, which is, which is typically around six to 10 acres for the largest of these. Uh, and they, those would serve about 200 to 500 homes. But these don't have to just be large facilities. These could be rooftops. These could be smaller facilities as well. So I don't, I don't think we want to limit our understanding of what these are to the large solar farms. Um, <clears throat> a little bit more about the pilot program. They, um, they set up their, their regs in 2016. It's a three-year three program that they started accepting applicants in 2017. So this pilot's going to run into 2020. And then when it ends, they're going to look at the impacts to the grid, evaluate the program, and, and make recommendations if it should uh, continue on as currently uh, permitted or if they want to make some changes to it. Um, once the pilot program ends, they're uh, the subscribers have uh, at least, as long as they're a subscriber, they're locked into those rates, or for up to 25 years, even if the commission decided to not move forward with the same uh, regulations for the, for the uh, community solar in the state. Um, and they've, they've set aside uh, about a third of the capacity for uh, low and moderate income uh, programs. So, you know, how does this fit into Carroll County? You know, what's the current status of the regulations and, and the limitations, and, and what are some of the benefits? Um, so, our, our currently, the zoning, uh, we don't mention community solar, of course. It's uh, solar energy conversion facilities, solar systems, again. Um, and we divide those into principal use and accessory use. Um, now, community solar, how does that fit in? Well, it, under the there's some technicalities in, in some of the ways that the definitions are currently set up. So it, it would be considered a commercial use because the energy being sub, uh, generated is, tra is sent to the transmission lines and, and, and basically for off-site customers. Um, and so uh, community solar is also considered a principal use um, because accessory use is defined as non-commercial and for on-site use. So there's some limitations to how it could be implemented currently. Um, <coughs> again, it's it, principal use, it's, it's commercial. It's currently in its form with the zoning regs would be allowable in business and industrial zones as a principal use. But in that definition says that any other use, site use would be subordinate to it as a principal use. So, uh, well, some limitations on some te technicalities there. So currently, it would not be permitted um, in districts where only accessory use is allowed. Um, a lot of benefits. Uh, yeah, there's economies of scale rather than a few panels on a house. Uh, 
the, the customer, the producer, uh, will have more money to put to work in the economy in other ways. Um, there's opportunities for community integration, so if it's a business or a nonprofit, can open up uh, subscribers to their patrons um, or, or the local um, community. Uh, there's tax incentives for the owner of the facility. Um, to the, to the uh, county, see an increase in solar jobs, um, opportunity for lessening our dependence on fossil fuels and carbon footprint and uh, increased environmental stewardship. Um, so currently they're able to subscribe to a facility that's built anywhere in the service territory. So they don't have to be built in Carroll County. A resident could subscribe to one outside the county as long as they're in the same utility territory. But again, these are kind of limited in size, and I think they're typically going to be local, and the subscribers are going to be local to the facility. So we, I think we, we do want to look at, oh, you know, um, how access to building these in yeah, is, is in Carroll County, not just subscribing. So I think we can go to the next one here for a few. Um, some of the challenges and um, opportunities that we have to promote uh, and expand access in the county. Um, again, the county residents can subscribe to ones that are outside the county, so, so that's a good start. Um, that's currently available, but again, we don't know quite yet how available that's going to be in the future because this is there, a lot of these are still kind of up and running. Um, Within, currently within business and industrial, I think uh, there's a, close to 46 vacant properties that, that could be available for a facility as a principal use. But again, uh, rooftops, I think, provide a good opportunity here, some of the larger warehouses and things like that. Schools, various things like that um, could certainly provide some other opportunities. Um, Again, it's not permitted where only accessory use is, so you wouldn't be able to do a community solar rooftops, uh, parking lot canopies at churches, schools, shared space in uh, residential developments and things like that would not currently be available based on our zoning definitions. Um, Can't do parking lot canopies uh, the way we were written? Doesn't help, I guess not. I, it probably comes to accessory use versus principal use. Mm -hmm. So, and there's some locations where that would that may work, but this, there could be some limitations in others. I think there's some other structural issues with the code that, um, you know, I, I confirmed with with Jay Voigt, the zoning administrator, that they don't we don't currently allow those parking canopy solar facilities. But I think it's more than just the accessory issue. There's um, like structure and electric issues associated with those that have to be would have to be modified to allow um, yeah some obvious limitations to expanding this would be you know we want to make sure that it would uh, align with the rest of the county's values so we didn't look much at um, options for an agricultural zone or conservation zoning districts um, with ag preservation and and forced uh, forestation values and things like that but again as an accessory use on a rooftop could be some opportunities there um, depending on how how the definitions might you know could look at look at the, at the zoning definitions um, and then again if you were to ex within the business district if this were to be very profitable or something you, you could compete for land uh, with uh, normal retail businesses or things like that for land values could could become a factor theoretically. Um, so again, there's economies of scale. There's a lot of studies that you know, but this is a hedge. Uh, the way this works is you subscribe to the value that the facility produces, and uh, you're kind of locked into a rate which is is designed as a hedge against rising uh, energy costs in the future, and so savings could vary over time. But typically, there's four to 24 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, the subscriptions are transferable with the home. So home values, the homes typically sell faster and have, have more value if there's solar attached to it. Um, so 
just again to kind of look at some of the potential options to, um, to increase access in the future. You could look at the zoning definitions, um, whether to incorporate it within one or another pr principal accessory or, or set a, a different um, category for community solar and, and list the available you know, zones, how it would fit into those. Um, you, could, you could look at you know, advantages to allowing it as an accessory use for, again, homeowner associations, developments, rooftops on, on nonprofits or schools um, outside of the current business and industrial zones. Um, they would have the, could work into the employment campus or rooftop uh, or uh, so, uh, parking lot canopies um, or some of the, the main ones we, we highlighted. Um, so next steps that we, we kind of highlighted were to look at those options. We could potentially evaluate any or all of those in, a, in another work item or um, engage public outreach materials on what's currently available to subscribers or what's currently available to uh, you know, people that might consider uh, constructing one of these, applying and, and building one of these. Um, so as, a, as a public outreach materials for them. Um, currently, there's, a, there's some of these that are up and running in Maryland now, um, but it's uh, f every year there's a few more and it takes a while to get, to get them online. So um, not a lot of, of examples out there yet, but there are a few and I've started to see some advertisements even recently now for the first time on, uh, on the internet for for some of these. Um, I'm not very familiar with these, though. These are kind of new. So uh, there's one, at least in Westminster, I believe. Maybe, Brenda, you could speak to these. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot of information that I have available about them, but I just wanted to let you know that they are starting to come online. And the reason they're only just now starting to come online is because the process to go through the Public Service Commission and getting approved takes a while, and then, of course, to install it. So. I've maybe found nine, um, and they're grouped by uh, utility service area, and I found three in the BGE service area, one of which happens to be in Westminster. And it's a little difficult to compare the, pro the projects apples to apples <coughs> because each one of them seems to have its own terms and conditions, but I did include this information just to show you that, that some of them are starting to come online and really consumers are going to need to look at all of their options to decide which one has the best terms for them. Uh, they don't need to find a, a community solar facility that's in the county. It just needs to be in this, the utility service area. So someone in Carroll County can subscribe to a community solar facility if they're in the BGE area. It can be in Baltimore County. It could be in Hartford County, anywhere in the, in the BGE service area. So it doesn't have to be in the county. But we do. this one is in the city of Westminster or within their corporate limits. So again, if the pilot study ends in 2020, they're going to look at how to move forward. Um, the programs that have already been established are going to be allowed to continue for quite some time. So the benefits that they're bestowing uh, will continue to be seen for some time. And they may decide to open up access further. And so when that time comes, we thought it would be good to you know, be well informed on how it fits into the current zoning regs and if you guys can consider. Uh, any changes you might want to make to to be prepared for that, um, uh, you know, if the market were to expand. Do you know if there's any interest in other companies putting community solar anywhere else in Carroll County? Have you heard anybody out reaching out for that? No. Um, that's probably a better question for Jay Voigt, but I, <coughs> if I recall correctly, I think he may have, may have had a few inquiries, but I don't know that there's actually anything moving forward at this point. Right. Sure. The, the one you're seeing up here actually went through the whole the process development review process, site plan process, and does, I, I'm pretty sure it has approval from us. And this actually is, if I'm not mistaken, is at Wakefield Valley Road Route 31. There's a piece of property there, and I believe that's where that, this one is located. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah, as Brendan indicated, Jay's had numerous inquiries, but I think because of some of our zoning regulations and all people aren't, they're inquiring, but then they're maybe looking at other places because there are some limitations, you know, to actually doing it. So, so again, there's two issues here, I think, that if I could. <laughs> there's the education part of it, letting people know that it's available, right. even if we don't have them here. And then there's the issue of 
you know, do we want to expand or allow them here, you know, that type of use here? Uh, because we do have some limitations in our zoning now, as they indicated, some technicalities and things that we could clean up to do it, if that's the case. That, this one here that you're looking at is actually in the industrial zone, for the industrial zone piece. And they are currently allowed in industrial zone anyway, that's correct, yes. right. So while we're looking at our zoning codes right now, maybe be a time to look at maybe cleaning this up so they could be allowed in other areas if that's what people wanted to do. Depends on how you want to move forward. Right, with it. right. No, like, like Jesse said, we looked at uh, properties that are zoned commercial industrial in the county and found 46 of them that had the space to do it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't include um, properties that are already developed that can have, they, can, they might have a principal use on them already, but they can have, since um, solar would be a principal use, they can have both as principal uses. So maybe they would fill their rooftop and actually have both uses on the property. So those 46 properties don't include that potential as well. So it's not, um, it, it's not like it's not available at all for Carroll County. So, and just one uh, anecdotal example. So you could consider um, like a church or something, a large, uh, facility, there's private school or a church with a large rooftop in um, a zone that would only allow accessory use. Um, so, you know, by en uh, enabling them the opportunity to put one on their roof, their only other option would be to go to business industrial zone, either buy a, a property or lease it and put in one of these facilities, which would be a much greater expense, where if they just wanted to put on a much smaller community solar facility on, on their large roof and offer subscriptions to the community or to their patrons or something like that, uh, they wouldn't be current, likely wouldn't be currently an option for them. Okay. All right, good idea. Any other questions? No. no these are great. Very good, yeah. Brenda, I give you some credit, I guess, for putting these together. I, I, <laughs> finalize the report for them <laughs> <laughs> under the direction of the board but I, I think you probably get a lot of credit for making these happen in this in this format I would think so it was a, a group effort well she does a great job herding the cats so to speak <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah yeah she that leftover budget money she should get a raise. There you go. So, <laughs> if I can put my two cents worth it, so. well, it's a lot of information and we have some reading to do but yeah I thank you guys for what you're doing here, and Brenda, uh, especially you, with where you're going on this, thank what you. you've done. We have one more item for you. Um, I'm very excited to present this one to you. The, um, and this is on the SolSmart, which is a uh, <coughs> national uh, designation and recognition for um, solar activities in the county. So um, the purpose of it is to recognize communities that have taken significant steps to make solar easy to do in the county um, and to also to address so, um, the soft costs of solar, which right. would be um, permitting and like all those types of things as opposed to the actual hard construction. Reducing those soft costs makes it cheaper and easier for customers to invest in solar energy. So that's the idea of reducing those costs um, or targeting the soft costs. The benefits of participation in the program are increased um, return on investment for solar customers. Um, there would be time and money savings for the county government by reducing the soft costs. And also they anticipate, you would anticipate that you would have a growth in the solar industry in terms of jobs and their investment in the community. And of course, why are we bringing say, this to Go back to that last slide. Mm -hmm. Who put that clock in there? doesn't have 12 hours on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, go ahead. Shorter day. That's the new solar <laughs> clock. There's only 20 <laughs> hours in the day. It's it's I'm looking at that thinking. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. How many hours solar is <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Somebody's paying attention, right? Yeah. It's actually an altimeter commission. <laughs> I've never been accused of being the most observant person. <laughs> I'm sorry what I said, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> Take it all that back. That raise was so close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so why are we bringing this to you? Well, 
This was <laughs> discussed at the annual joint meeting with the commissioners last January, and this was in or February, and was included in the um, EAC's work plan for 2018, and that was to actually complete the application on behalf of the county um, to apply for a designation from the SoulSmart program. And um, so that is what we did this year. It's the process started by developing a solar statement, and the solar statement is essentially um, indicating the county's commitment to solar development. And um, so we provided that. We looked at all the actions that we have already taken to facilitate solar development in the county. And then we had to, I worked with, um, closely with particularly permits and inspections, Lionel Stickles and Jason Green, and they were a big help in getting that documentation together too, to show that we had done these things. And there were a few things that we identified that we could actually do to get additional points and get that designation. And then finally we submitted the application in September. The, the, the application is essentially a scorecard. And there's, you get points for act, actions that you have taken. There's two foundational categories, which are permitting and then planning, zoning, and development regulations. So there are things that you have to do in those categories in order to even qualify. And then there's six um, special focus areas. And of course, we looked at all of these things to see what actions we've taken and what um, areas we could get points in. So we were able to get points in four of those six special focus areas. The uh, scorecard, when you get designated, there's a graduated level of designation. There's bronze, silver, and gold. We were able to earn points, um, particularly prerequisites in each level for the bronze and the silver. So I am happy to report to you, congratulations, you have earned silver designation um, for the Soul Smart program. And the Soul Smart program, I, I didn't um, indicate oh. in the beginning, but this oh. is done through NACO, Very the nice. National Association of Counties and National League of Cities in cooperation with some other organizations. I have to get a picture of that for you all. Well, that, that is on my list. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I did want to... What? Show, point out that okay. we are the first county in Maryland to receive a, de a Soul Smart designation, and the only other jurisdiction in Maryland to have it at this point is uh, Laurel. So that's we have that. First. And I also wanted to point out that three of the main areas where we were able to get the points in order to get this designation were act activities that have happened with permits and inspections, um, zoning activities, and of course the EAC's own work, particularly the guide to. Um, residential solar installation in Carroll County, which was completed last year. <coughs> Who that, asked for that? That earned a lot of points. Excuse me? Who asked for that? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, it's me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I know you're agile as a wrestler. Be careful patting yourself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty good at that, isn't he? Uh, go ahead. So, um, to me when you said that. As, as Frank showed you, we have the plaque, and of course I'm going to ask you guys to come around yeah. front so we can get a picture um, of you holding the plaque. Can I ask how close we were to the gold? Very oh, close. you don't want to say don't that. Tell them okay. you'll feel the dragon again. <laughs> just well, asking. we were very close. Okay. But um, I'm not sure. You know, every jurisdiction is different, and, and given how we're set up, it'd be very difficult to earn those last few points to get okay. that. Not, I'm not saying it's impossible. But, but we could reapply next year for the same thing and see where it turned out if we yes. made some changes to, to yes. certain things. Okay. Commissioner Frazier's motto was a solar panel on every roof and every backyard. We saved a lot of electricity. So um, while I'm also going to, you don't have to um, tell me this now, but you might want to think about where you'd like the plaque to be, and we'll wait for direction from you on that so that we can arrange to have it put up. <laughs> But for now, I'm going to ask you to come down. Sure, let's, uh, let's get a picture. Get picture. <laughs> I'd rather have that than be doing this all the time. Especially the idol, because it's got a tie on it. I didn't recognize it earlier. Well, actually, Brenda, <laughs> uh, she did uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 right in there. Yeah. Another person you 
state for Carol. Yeah. No, 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 no. Scooching. Get friendly, everybody. <laughs> The lens, the lens. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
on Wednesday, November 14th at 9.30 a.m., Carroll County Farm Museum Advisory Board meeting in Westminster, Commissioner Weaver. At 5 o'clock, a Board of Education Board meeting in Westminster, Commissioner Weaver. At 6 p.m., Carroll Community College Board meeting in Westminster, Commissioner Wentz. On Thursday, we're having a public hearing for a zoning text amendment reducing required BZA newspaper advertisements for board zoning hearing from one from two to one. We also have a briefing on comprehensive rezoning on commercial industrial employment text proce uh, procedure. We have a briefing on mountain area annexation number 42, Dorsey Town. We have request approval to submit application for Medicare improvements to Patients and Providers Act. At 11.30, we have the Ark of Carroll County Technology Coaching Center luncheon in Westminster, Commissioners Wentz and Howard. At 1.30, we're moving on to a bid approval for removal. We move and replace two AC units at Historic Courthouse. Thursday, November 15th, at 4.30 p.m., Carroll Promise Scholarship uh, Reception, Carroll Community College, uh, Commissioner Wentz. On Saturday the 17th, USS Sioux City uh, a Commission in Annapolis with Commissioner Howard at 9 a.m. Commissioners report that at week is Commissioner Wentz, 705, in case you're wondering. Is there anything else? Then we need a motion to adjourn. Seven. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.